Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, very special live broadcast interview with two very special artists who one performed last night, the other is in charge of closing one of the stages, the Cooper stage, if I'm not mistaken, this evening. We have A.G. Cook. Hello. And Sega Bodega. Hello. Mike. Can they hear us? Yeah, they, they can. Oh, wow. there's, a, yeah. there's a loudspeaker outside. It's a two-way uh, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> how does it feel to be back in Primavera this year? Both of you with new music under your belts? Yeah, I was here two years ago uh, for a similar but different kind of set. Uh, and now I've released an album recently, Britpop. So it was just kind of the first big Britpop DJ set. So it was amazing. I love this festival. It's great. I haven't. I, like, I don't think I've played. I haven't played here before. I did. I'm, we talked. I did a... You came to our radio yeah, years yeah. ago, and you did thing. You've done stuff for the Primavera Universe, yeah, I know. Yeah, and you, yeah, but not like this. The Primavera you, Extended Universe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the franchise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, same. I haven't. You're done doing a, a new show, right? It's new, I haven't done a show in two years. Wow. You haven't done a show, but this say, is the first show I've done in two years, and I don't have a sound check. So <laughs> it's quite. Yeah. Why don't you have a sound check? Primavera is always offering sound checks to artists. That's what makes well, us. Wow! Don't better. get in. Don't get into the <laughs> it No, was it your don't, choice? Don't talk about that. No. <laughs> why would I choose that? Okay. That's crazy. <laughs> but Sega, because I mean, in the past you've performed with string quartets. You've performed on your own with guitars. With uh, for is first of all, is tonight's show going to be built around Dennis mainly? Your latest album? Uh, yeah, definitely. And it's more just like uh, a club. I'm trying to move to more towards club because I think I don't want to be the f I like leaving it to the music and the lights rather than the me yeah because there's so much production that goes into the actual music and there's so much processing on the vocals and it's like I can't replicate that live so let's just give like a, a an electronic music performance rather than trying to be a trying to be the pop star how, how was your set last night? You said it was your first Britpop set, right? Uh, it was my first Britpop sort of DJ, VJ set. I've done this kind of roadshow version where I go, I, I mean, I have a similar kind of thing to Sega in the sense that we both do club tracks, we both sing on things. Uh, there's some kind of hybrid. I think we have a pretty different approach to dealing with it, but the, I, did a, I did nine shows as part of the Britpop roadshow that was like going between really, really stripped back kind of guitar almost unaccompanied stuff and then really loud electronic stuff and yeah doing the whole range of that was really fun but i thought for primavera at 4 a.m it would be better to <laughs> yeah. just Acoustic do a hard, well you know play wonderwall etc but no i thought <laughs> i thought it'd be good to like yeah just do a really solid hour plus set of lots of my edits mashups and, and I, I sort of when i'm djing it's a lot of just like using them as samplers, messing around, uh, and having uh, Rick Farron do live visuals. Uh, Rick's also collaborated with the Sega stuff a bunch. So yeah, I mean, I just I just designed the set backwards from the set time, and I was like, okay, I'll just do this. Yeah, and I cut a lot of things from my set too. I had like, I was like imagining it in my head as a thing with the sun setting, and then I remembered the time, and then I had to change everything. because Sun rising. Kind of. It's neither really though. It's sunrise is like just after. Isn't it's it just now? like I had to go fully, just like let's try and keep it up. Ah, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, PC music is such an important part of like, you know, if we understand Primavera Sound as one of the, fest the best festivals to keep up with latest trends, the way music is uh, morphing into popular landscapes. Uh, PC music has been a strong part of the Primavera Sound lineup in general for the past five years or so. I yeah. Think, from, yeah. Uh, what? First of all, why have you decided to close the label when it was just about to become like, I imagine, f a financially viable enterprise? <laughs> <laughs> I like that take. Yeah, I just got to that place on Monopoly board and I was like, fuck it. No, no. I, I, I think, I think, genuinely. Uh, doing 10 years or something and being able to give it context and reflect on stuff. I mean, there's lots and lots of different reasons. I mean, we've all had experiences of like indie labels, indie boutique things, that kind of stuff. 
it was also pre and post streaming. You know, if you think about the music industry from 2013 to 2023, so much stuff happened. And I think context is really important. So PC is still going in the sense of these, I keep alluding to these top secret archival special reissue, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But uh, it felt really important to do that. I mean, I don't know how you feel, Sal, but I feel like there's tracks from like 2012, 2011, well, 2013, those kind of days are uh, almost impossible to find online. You know, like SoundCloud, YouTube adjacent, and they're all kind well, of I love that you started crawl. a website. I love that you started a whole thing where it's just like its own thing, because I think that's where everything should go to, is like individual platforms for artists rather than all being on kind of one thing. And this like way to like contextualize things. I think I love that you did like 10 years. That was it, 10. Yeah, 10 and also- You like, <laughs> you like a, a uh, a rounded, yeah, you like to yeah. full circle things. Organization systems, three discs, seven discs, kind of, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. You, no, I mean, I, I think a lot about that, but also I really think about the early era, you know, suffering this kind of post streaming link rot where like I, I'm thinking of like a random track and like, oh, I wish I could find that and I just can't. So I think someone like me who can be a bit of a ringleader, I think could also be responsible for making sure that not all of that kind of important work just sort of evaporates into. Yeah. Yeah. Have you lost things? Are there tracks that you're like, I know I made that and I, you know. Yeah, I'm a little bit. I'm not, I'm not the worst person at that. I have some people are, are really bad offenders with that, but I'm, I'm okay. I think it's more just, you know, it's inevitable. And, and I'm even talking about other people's tracks, like things that I like that I yeah. can just about find on YouTube if I like really try. Yeah. And then I think next year will already be gone, you know? And well, that's stuff that really influenced me. Sal, what about you? Are you good at organizing your, your hard drives? And especially when you're working for so many other people and, and you've got your ideas and your sketches, are you, are you well organized with your, uh, with your hard drives? Uh, or do you embrace chaos? It's kind of both. I, it's, I don't have, I, I lose, I always move, I lose, kind of in more complicated ways, like I will move like, audio files rather than actual projects more just like the stems of things so that when i go back to the project i still have the project and everything's there but all the drums are gone hmm. it's not our fault the technology it's, sucks I, you know yeah i know it's really like it's like this i know i have to replay and i would have probably replaced it anyway but like i definitely lose i know i i, I lose quite a lot of things yeah <laughs> uh, alex i wanted to ask because you're living um you're living in the united states yeah um, and I personally found that when when I moved moved well, moved out of the UK, that was when I lost a lot of my music and I kind of lost a lot of big connection. I'm both like physically losing it and also losing a kind of connection to it in a way. Did you find that? I, mean, I know you've released an album called Britpop, but like, why'd you call it Britpop? Yeah, it's sort of about not being in the UK. I think if I still lived in London, I I wouldn't be able to survive the cringe of calling an album. Britpop, you know, if I, <laughs> I was literally there. I love Britpop. That, no, I mean, I, I I like it on a lot of levels, but it felt meaningful to me when I was not just in the US, but in the whole pandemic lockdown. Spent a whole year in Montana, which is where my girlfriend grew up. We went back there, and I was pretty much the only like British person in town, and that created a whole dynamic where I started to see the sort of weird fantasy history kind of metaphorical stupidity of, of British culture yeah. and I just started to enjoy thinking about that in relation to me and PC and on genre in general and the extremes of genre that I like electronic not all the arguing that comes with that sort of culture so it started to feel quite meaningful to me but specifically because I had moved to the US and seeing it through that kind of lens as well I think uh, I mean it's a brave it's a brave album title yeah no it's great yeah why not i mean you have to i mean i think i think yeah titles are really important i, I like it too because you know people don't agree on what pop is anyway yeah. like mm -hmm. that's already such a yeah. kind of contested term so brit pop is even more more confusing and i think it, it, the, the the bit where it started to feel meaningful was when i started to divide the album into past present future yeah which felt like quite a british thing to do in a <laughs> sad way but also then I, I was like oh this is meaningful for me i can have these different approaches and it started to not feel too gimmicky and i also banned red white and blue from the campaign There's none yeah of that. i was you did it like you kind of walk a very fine line of this could be, you know, the Brexit quite nationalist. The, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that was a whole, I mean, yeah, that's the whole thing. I, I felt, yeah, I was like finding joy in a way of not making it a nationalist thing and, and doing yeah. this sort of alternate reality flag like and so on. So I had to think about that a lot. I think if I'd just gone in full Jerry Hallowell, Union Jack, it would have been a fail. <laughs> that's the next album. 
No, never. <laughs> Speaking of album <laughs> titles, uh, Sal, Sega, uh, I hear there's an interesting story as to why you called your latest album Dennis. Could you please relay it for us for this one? Well, there's lots of reasons the name kept coming up. Is that like... <sighs> it takes a long time for me to get into the root of why I called it that and like why I... It's like really how I think the world works. And okay, so I'm just going to say it. Um, I, I kind of have this, con I'm convinced that we as humans are all being pumped the same information from an outside source. It sounds kind of ridiculous, but these things of like, as humans, we, we've always kind of, ideas always come at the same time for many people and they'll be so specific to the day. Um, and I think that sometimes when we dream and when we sleep, that's where the information gets downloaded and re-uploaded. And I, I don't, I, I, I have a, a lot of questions as to what happens when we actually sleep, like where we actually go, like what. Recently I was actually, why do we need to sleep? Like, why is it that I can eat as much food in the day, conserve as much energy, but after I would just crush, like there's, n there's no amount of energy that I can just to keep going. Yeah, it's not proven, is it, by science, exactly where we sleep. Right? Why can't, why why can't I just stay awake forever? based off supplying my body with energy like i have to anyway so there was this thing of like yeah me thinking like why throughout history we'll always see these things happen where multiple people across the planet through no communication whatsoever have the exact same ideas yeah and then i was thinking about i was reading about dennis the menace and how that was a british cartoon and an american cartoon yeah yeah about a young yeah, boy and his dog called dennis the menace came out in the 19, early 1950s and it came out on the same day and they had no idea. It was just a complete coincidence. And then I was also reading about that name, Dennis, and I have a song called Only Seeing God When I Come. And I looked at the origins of Dennis and it comes from the Greek god Dionysus. Dionysus? Or Dionysus? Dionysus, Dionysus or the, Dion the, yeah, yeah. And he is the god that comes. He's the person that brings like the party, he brings wine, he brings like, and then I always talk about heaven and hell and the like sin and, and Dennis backwards was sinned. So I was just like, that's the name of the time. It just kept coming up mm. while I, and I, I happened to just name my albums after, you know, male names. And this one just kept coming up. So I was like, that's the name. And I, re I felt felt really right it, sometimes you just feel you just feel it when it works on more than one level it's and also all those meanings kind of came slowly after i'd already decided it oh. mm. so like i decided it was and then i just kept saying it's like oh that's or that or that or that i mean we've got to interpret the codes there are codes out there i, I believe in that i just yeah. don't know why that ha that keeps happening and like yeah. how like it and it will keep happening and it will and it happens what's some other like, examples there's loads ants bug life ants it happens in animals too like Hive there was minds. like this like there was like you know, birds all across the country all figured out at the same time how to uh, get into milk cartons. But like, I mean, communication is one thing, but also just like all at the same time. It happens a lot. And um, yeah, I don't know. I just find it interesting. I want to know where this information is coming from and why it's. Well, it's, it's, like, all, it's like the pyramids thing, you know, it's like also the, the pyramids thing. Like and the, the, they, it's all, yeah, they all had this. The structure that they designed all around, like how it all comes from this information. Like, where do you, they don't know where you get this knowledge, but yeah. they just have it. And that's why I think making music is also a thing because a lot of times I'll be making music and I'm, I am vacant on my hands and my eye. I am somewhere else and the song is just coming out of me. And you don't have any say or decision making in the process. So that's why I think like you can't force a song. It just has to, it just comes and like within 10 minutes you have this thing that, you know, deeply resonates with you and with other people. So I find that really interesting. And I ask you both, how, how do you do that? Because if you need to be kind of vacant to make a song, how do you stop yourself thinking about it too much? Or does it just... I don't. You do, you do and you don't. Sometimes you are thinking about it. I think sometimes the worst music comes from when you're trying to make a hit song. Hmm. The, most, the most interesting music I've ever heard in my life. I know for a fact they weren't trying to make a pop song. It happened. But it, it becomes a very popular song. Yeah. You know? I don't know. I think moving bet between 
kind of contrasting things is also really important. You know, I'll be working on a sketch of something and then not overthinking it and doing something else and like being ready to delete something or go back or mm. change a form constantly and uh, kind of have a different perspective all the time as, as much as possible. Yeah. S speaking of being pop I also, oh, can I just say, Sorry. I love that you just, you like you'll keep going back. You want like, and I really admire that you do that and uh, Caroline does it. It's just like reusing this, the same melodies. Yeah, like, I won't necessarily like, leave an idea alone. Why? Like, why? Would, why would yeah. you though? Because it's like just keep bringing it back and like just the IDL. Yeah, yeah. I think it's fun too because you know it's like it makes it more than just a, a track in a kind of cold way. It's like when yeah. it's why I'm interested in edits, remixes, covers, interpretations, things feeling like they're cycling around in a way. Uh, it's just it's it's fun because music is so sticky. You know, it's yeah. that's sort of what it's about. Uh, so I love yeah doing that intentionally, unintentionally, whatever. Um, as we've got both of you here, I'm kind of quite interested to know what you most like about each other's music. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> flatter each other. <laughs> wow, yeah, radio I, format. I, I hate yeah, his music. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I've always loved just how like, like it, for the clean. It's how, everything's very clean. Yeah, I never know what you're gonna do next. You've approached pop music in a really fun way. Um. And I like, I mean, I just think you, especially you and Charlie, like that's such a, that was kind of such a necessary thing to happen. I, necessary, th yeah, it was necessary for pop. Like it's just, I don't know, there's yeah. so much about it. I'd also just love that you went fully back into guitars. Yeah, you, I mean, we both, I mean, yeah, I feel like we've known each other for ages now. And, and I remember, uh, I remember seeing you DJ really early on. I wouldn't like, have been good. No, no, it was very good. I think, I think, uh, I feel, like a lot of your stuff is very visceral and i think it relates to what you're saying about about tapping out and not overthinking stuff and i feel like i can really hear that in the sort of in the grain in the dirt of stuff yeah. uh, and i think i feel like that's how you reference things i don't know if it's always in that kind of overly formal way but it's in the either i feel like resampling or or kind of just it reminds me of someone DJing in a very confident oh, cool. way. Do you know I, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I like, I like that. That's, yeah, I like when a set is going all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of going all over the place or, well, or, or, or yeah, not, because a lot of great albums are all about the editing and, and like we locked into a mood here and, and set 10 tracks or whatever. AD, <coughs> you... In, in a time where people have uh, short attention spans and people are releasing shorter albums, you decide to release three disc albums, five disc albums, seven disc albums, uh, no filter. Uh, could you defend that decision to be so generous with your output no, on your album? No, it's indefensible. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think honestly, I was less interested in albums, I would say, a decade ago or the start of PC, you know. I was very interested in SoundCloud mixes and things having... A kind of formless quality and 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 kind of repetition DJ sets stuff like that uh, whole artist projects rather than albums you know thinking of it in yeah. a very zoomed out way I would say streaming is where I, I see a sort of turning point where there's such a deluge of stuff and then you know you're like what is it 150,000 tracks uploaded a day like yeah. more albums per week than you could rationalize and then suddenly it's this context thing again and I'm like I, I, I want to bend that category I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to make the perfect 10 or 11 tracks but at the same time I'm very conscious that albums do matter simply because we need something to grab onto beyond even just eras or, or anything so I suddenly got very interested in albums but then you know then it was like oh Apple and 7G happening at the same time that felt felt to me like the real album was somewhere in the middle of those and then mm. with Britpop as well I feel like you could listen to the individual parts and the real album could be quite subjective, but it is an album, you know. So, so it's sort of fighting this strange battle, but yeah. uh, not winning it really. It's almost like you released the box set before the album. Yeah, but that's <laughs> what I mean. All these, ca all these categories is just interesting in itself because mm. you know, you know, it can just why even divide up audio? You know, it's just it's all it, it's very arbitrary. But I think it's a it's a fight for sort of meaning and and actually just enjoying it in a, in a way. Yeah. And it's funny because, Sal, you said that, you know, what, what uh, A.G. and Charlie mean as, as a duo, you know, a, a producer and, and her who's such a talent, you know, such a, she's got such vision. By the way, she's performing tomorrow. Are you going to have anything to do with the performance? Uh, will there be any kind of 
anything for you to do on her tambourine yeah hopefully i sort of get airdropped in you know <laughs> like a, a helicopter or a crane or something like that okay but you talk of that relationship but we have to talk about you and caroline i mean caroline uh, Politech was our headliner last year and that is well just a dream to look at uh, the, the show the, and the, the music specifically sunset which is a song I that mean, that's the only one we've released so far together yeah didn't you do the whole of desire daniel Hart. Oh, sorry, that's it. Sorry, I can... it's because you're all mates. I confuse you all. Sorry, but yeah, yeah, look alike. If you perfectly mix the two of us, you'll get Dan. I think right so. Here. Honestly, right. I do think so. Yeah. But I know yeah. that as representatives of Dan, uh, we we appreciate your uh, uh, love for design. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. also, Sunset. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, yeah, Sunset, yeah. and also because you know, because I know you're close. You, when when pandemic during the pandemic, Caroline was here in Barcelona, uh, making yeah, part of was, uh, that Desire. Was, that was actually an awful trip for me. Was it? Yeah, so she, she was like, okay, let's go to Barcelona, finish the track. And I was like, that sounds amazing. And then I get there to the studio. She's booked out like four days. And I get to the studio and it's like a specific brand that I do not use because it's fucked up my laptop before. And I was like, do you have anything else? And he was like, no, this is it. And I was like, okay. And I plugged it in. And I downloaded the driver and my whole laptop just <gasps> gone. And then for the next two hours, I'm trying to figure it out. I take it to the Mac store. They're like, this is, you know, you need to wipe this and start again. Uh, so that whole trip was actually kind of root. And then when I got back to the studio, he was like, well, I do also have this other sound card. <laughs> and it, was my, it was a sound card that could have perfectly used it. But yeah, that, that trip was destined to be amazing. But I just ended up having like a holiday in Barcelona with Caroline. And also while, while talking about Caroline, I think it's, it's really worth noting. I mean, I've worked on a few tracks of her recently yeah. that have come out and I mean, she does so much production as well. Yeah. I, yeah. Mean, I mean, seriously, uh, it's, it's, does, it's she's, she's the easiest person to work. She, like, she will tell you, she knows exactly what she wants at all times. And it's very, and also just like, you know, th there's a language that comes to making music and she has, she knows it better than anyone I know. And hands on with Ableton and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's virtuosic. Very, yeah. Talking of Daniel Hall, um, when we <laughs> when, when we interviewed him, we, we asked him basically some of our uh, of his favourite songs, and his his um his answers were quite inspired. So I thought I'd yeah. run it run it past you because he said he, he has what a, was it? Okay, cool. favourite love song. He's a bullshit honestly. He is talking shit. I don't believe anything he says. Okay, well give, give us your favourite love song, and I'll tell you. I'll tell My you. My favourite love song, honestly, is it's kind of, you, you want to give a fun answer. But like my favorite love song is probably wait that's love song or like heartbreak song. Love song. I don't know. It's all the same genre. It's a heartbreak. Heartbreak one. and love. Yeah, I can't make you love me. I think 10 CC I'm not in love is genuinely oh, that, very good. Yeah, yeah. The facetiousness of the hanging the picture on the wall and that kind of stuff it yeah, really resonates with me. Yeah. Well, he said Ecuador by Sash. No, he said Kiss from a Rose by Seal. No, for no, no, song. no. That was the most beautiful musical construction. That's it. So he's that is his sorry. true answer, that one. He's that, that he believes, that. I believe him on that. I, I, I believe, I actually believe him on the other one. I don't think Daniel Hall is capable of love. So Ecuador is probably <laughs> the... <laughs> Ecuador. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Ecuador, well, I don't know if anything to say about that, so you can ask, but go uh, the song. No, not Ecuador, <laughs> Chile, uh, oh, yeah. a bit further down. <laughs> I'm terrible. <laughs> now that we're talking about Latin America, let's go and talk about your Chilean roots. Have you ever found anything interesting in Chilean folklore since you know it's part of your I, I have quite a ancestry. disconnect with that side of my family because I never really knew my dad, mm -hmm. so like I never, I'm very much raised by my Irish mother. So we, um, I like it because I get to use the drums and don't have to worry about anyone being mad at me. Yeah. Uh, People are annoying. And if you start using drums from different cultures, they start to have like a, they have to talk like, but like I get to do that. And that's why I like my Chilean side. Yeah, all you have to say is like, my name is Salvador Navarrete. Exactly. Cachai. <laughs> exactly. Okay. No, because it, it's always interesting when you have uh, backgrounds, no interesting backgrounds, no? Like maybe to try and establish a connection with, you know, yeah, I want to get into it more. Missing. I want to reach out. I want to go there. But it's a personally yeah. been a quite a. I, I've, I've put up a wall for some reason. Oh, yeah. I see. I don't know if it's because I was born in Scotland, lived there for many years, but I always see your music as being quite Scottish. Well, I grew up in Glasgow. Yeah, no, that, that's what I mean. I, do, I mean, I was. I mean, Hudson Mohawk and Rusty and Lucky Me were my like. This is my, rewired my brain when I heard them. 
This mm. forever. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I have to like Glasgow is definitely a big influence on and no, unknowingly it's been a huge influence on so many people, but I don't think it gets the credit it deserves, honestly. Especially yeah. like Rusty. <laughs> because Yeah. That but, essential mix. Like. The essential mix, the glass swords, I mean it all just it all changed the way it, everything took a left turn after those two. Yeah, no, it's massive. Yeah, Hudmo as well for me. Uh, yeah. All the early stuff, early remixes, and yeah, uh, Charlie and I worked with Hudmo on a couple of tracks on Brat as well. So that I was know, very full circle, cool. and um, I, yeah, I love those ones. So yeah, massive scene. But are you? You know, you guys are very. You seem very aware of 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 the world of the music industry you work in, and and you know, you you can count. You just look at your track records, both of you. Do you see? Do you understand that the future of like mainstream pop kind of is going to fall into your hands and ev eventually <laughs> just like Max Martin had a grip on mainstream pop for like the 2000s I think if, I think the greatest thing a, a person could do and a pop star could do is hire us two Arca Danny and we make up someone some one of the one of the one of the pop girls record I think it would be very good but it's not happened yet. I think I think there's a whole discussion of, of what mainstream is now. You know, if you yeah, talk about the like, whole Max Martin era, it's just such a different time. And I mean, he's still doing really interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, and his crew. But I think, yeah, it's just there isn't. I'm I'm really fascinated by music now, and I think there's tons of amazing stuff. But it, it's not falling into the same categories uh, that you have with that kind of production line. I think that's probably a good thing. But in terms of where mainstream music and the history of it is all going. I think, I think that's kind of it in a funny way. Well, I mean, cause, I mean, but it's just like you have huge culturally impactive songs that will never reach radio. And I think I've been tricked. I think we've all been tricked into thinking that radio is the mainstream and it's not. Well, no, it's TikTok and, it's and not, internet. It's, and it's just the, it's just, it's just the, the people, the people have just chosen what is like the big, but it's confusing because you can re, you can, I see artists kind of aspire to be this thing. I, it's just, it, it, we've kind of gotten to this weird place where you can have the, you can have billions of streams and you can impact culture in no way. And you can have a couple hundred thousand and everyone wants to be like you. It's just like this, you got these really influential artists and everyone knows who they are. And it's just this really funny place to be, which is great because it, but I just don't want anyone to get confused and reach for the wrong thing mm. because I see people dumbing down their ideas for this other avenue, which it doesn't need to be mm. because, yeah, I mean, yeah. But I mean, if you look out at Primavera Sound, I mean, that we, we've been watching the afternoon, all these sort of 19 to 23 year old people of like very colorful identities and and this is like this is pop Th these are the people who are enthusiastic about seeing lana del rey hannah diamond ag yeah. cook sega bodega they, they understand it there's the philosophy there's the queer philosophy behind it all it's liberating it's primavera i don't want to big up primavera as this big utopia but I think it you're is actually obliged to i'm kind of yeah <laughs> and, and and thank you Cooper. uh but no no but seriously it's it it before this was an indie festival and it was like full of indie blokes and people in skinny jeans and now this is like the colorful utopia of you know, the future, shall we say, you know, everyone's like free, it's a safe space, everyone feels liberated, everyone feels like truly expressive. And a lot of that comes from them, like they, whenever you ask them their favorite music, it's usually stuff that fits on PC, it's stuff that it's Caroline, it's Charlie, you know, and, and you guys are at the front of, you know, you're, you're behind there, or, or, or twiddling all the knobs. Uh, do you appreciate the utopian aspect of your music? What a long route I took to get <laughs> yeah. to that question. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think that I, I, have a, I have trouble really thinking of it as a utopia or dystopia, utopia, hybrids. Uh, I mean, I, I think, yeah, the, the fact that it is a subculture that can't be defined by one thing is amazing. Mm. I really like that, uh, that it, it doesn't have really defined borders. And, and I think it is uh, accepting in a lot of ways. Just in general, I, I've never got on with very strict binaries that are in a lot of genres anyway and i, I even yeah. talking you know <laughs> gender aside but just you know the whole whole way of operating so i think that there is this 
kind of emerging common ground, but I think it really has to be fought for, you know, like it, it's not, I, you can't take it for granted. Uh, I don't think it's managed to, to establish itself as a utopia yet. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Also, like I, I do, it is a, it is, yeah, I mean, I don't really have anything else to add to that. That's kind of it. Like, it's just, um, it can be quite bleak. But um, it's a very, I just, I mean, I just, I appreciate people who are bringing in, who, I mean, like, I just like, I also just like the fact that like, you know, you have like a complete resurgence of people like Aphex Twin. Like Aphex Twin's audience is fucking teenagers. That's a, and it's extremely weird IDM. And that's great because I think, I think ultimately people really do want to be challenged when it comes to listening to music. They think, and, and that's where a lot of people get it wrong when trying to make a big record is that people, they don't want to challenge you. But actually, most people want to be challenged with a song. I think I read somewhere that the ideal pop hit is something familiar and something new. So like, you've got, you, you, you know, like I mean, what- Yeah, if you can get that balance right, you've won. Yeah. But also at the same time, then like you have complete, I don't know, you're, yeah. I mean, it works both ways. What isn't something familiar and something new, honestly? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just like, <laughs> I, I, I mean, there, there, there's, yeah, there is times where it's just like, I have never heard it. Actually, you know what? Every time there's been like a, a, a defining kind of change, you know, it's something where you're like, this is perfectly in the balance of a whole, it's, this is why I think that like people always ask me like, like produce like younger people, like how do I, how do I get into making, how do you make this kind of music? And it's like all the people that they listen to, and I'm, I know you will be the same, is like, if you make, if you want to make hyper pop, let's say, and this is where I kind of- For example, yeah. For example, I'm not even going to use that, but that's the one where personally I've kind of struggled with where hyper pop went, is that I feel like the people that are new making hyper pop only ever listen to hyper pop. But the people who, let's just say 10 years ago were doing all this, they were listening to classical music, trance, bands, new metal, new metal. They, they really listened to it all and loved it all. And that's why they kind of merge into this weird thing. But when you kind of get that weird thing and it goes on 10 years later and the only the new versions of that are people who only listen to that one, mm. there's no edge to it anymore. I think it happens it, to every genre though, you know, it's it, like early, late grunge. Grunge, early, I was going to say, Nirvana, Nirvana was amazing. Everything that came after Bush and all that. But also Nirvana had, you know, influences from a bunch of stuff like Pixies Records and Steve yeah. Albini stuff, yeah. you know. So I think, I, I think it's just a, a nature of genre and you, the categories are useful, but then they run out of ammo yeah, of being yeah. useful, you, to, you know. To, so. you, to, you, it's, you can be as experimental as you want. And then eventually that experimental weird thing will be very formulaic and boring. That is what it is. It's just key. It's just and exactly, part it's of the same to, tree. Yeah. And I think those people who start doing that will are always going to make new things because they're always listening. You always can. I think if you got some people have good ideas forever, some people don't have good ideas forever. That's it. Well, look, thank you so much <laughs> thank for coming you along. So it's much. been an absolute pleasure to have to both of you together. Yeah, You're on, what time are you on? <laughs> 4.25? 4.25. Directly after Arca. So wow. directly after. The stages are near, it's, right? The it's like that. Actually. They're like, this is Arca, this is me. You yeah. should start and end on the same exactly. sound. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> pick up you know, like like a, yeah, when you, when you pick loop. up from the DJ before you or yeah. the artist. Yeah. Sega Bodega, AG Cook. What an honor. Uh, what an incredible interview. Thank uh, you, for, listening thank to you, you guys. for having Riff. us. Thank you for seeing and watching. Yeah, yeah. And thank you all. Muchas thank gracias. You. Uh, thank you all the audience watching us here in the forum. And thank you all the audience watching us at home. Uh, there's oh, a lot of you connected. Uh, remember, you can if you're staying at, if you're at home and not watching, you know, not here at the festival, you can watch performances being streamed on Amazon Prime, on through the Primavera Sounds Twitch. And we will be back tomorrow. Nosotros estaremos de vuelta mañana. Podéis ver conciertos ahora mismo si os metéis en Amazon Prime, en Twitch. Eh, es, están estimando muchos de los conciertos de los escenarios, ¿vale? Hay cosas. Hay cosas. Sí. Nos vemos mañana. Primavera Sound 2024. Vamos. Hey. Hyperpop is alive. <laughs> <laughs>